Welcome everyone to this panel on edge device security. Uh, I'm your host, Frédéric Desbien from the Eclipse Foundation. I'm program manager there for IoT and edge computing. Uh, our goal today is to have, you know, a wide ranging conversation about both the challenges and the potential solutions uh, to edge device security. And with me, I've got four fantastic guests in driving this conversation forward. Uh, so let's introduce them. Uh, first is uh, Dion. Uh, hello, hey, uh, my name is Dion. Uh, I'm an uh, engineer. Uh, uh, I work as an engineer for Red Hat. I've been in the IoT space for the last, like, last I think, five years or so, and uh, being drawn in, into the edge computing in the, in the last couple of, of years. Excellent. Next is Angelo. Okay, thank you, Frederick. So, Angelo Corsaro, uh, CTO at ADLink. Uh, within Eclipse, uh, I lead uh, quite a few, let's say, projects in the context of Eclipse uh, Edge Native and Eclipse IoT in between, uh, in between those. And I've been involved with edge and fog computing since uh, the very beginning. In fact, I was involved in some of the uh, super early projects uh, in, in this context. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Angelo. Nicola? Uh, thank you, Frederick. I'm Nicola um, La Gloria from Kinetics. Uh, my company uh, is members of the Eclipse Foundation, and I'm, the, I'm a member of the uh, edge uh, working group. Um, our company is actually in the OS operating system, embedded device operating system space, and um, we are also uh, contributors to a couple of projects inside the Eclipse Foundation. Thank you. And last but not least is Ted. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Ted Ross. Um, I'm an engineer out of the Boston area. I'm actually freelancing now, uh, working on some open source technologies uh, around the Scupper project, um, Apache Cupid Dispatch Router project. And my interest uh, is not so much IoT, but more uh, cloud networking and edge computing and the networking involved in the edge computing. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, first segment, uh, let's uh, start talking by in a general, you know, in a general setting about the challenges of edge security. Uh, so Dion, uh, what are, you know, the edge device security challenges and in, uh, in what way are they different from those of traditional IT? Uh, well, w one of the big differences that we have uh, when we talk about edge computing and differences between the cloud computing is, is that, you know, our hardware is, is much more geographically dispersed now, right? Being uh, being the, the clusters that are deployed outside of the data centers or, or just a single nodes of, of compute, uh, we have uh, devices that are not physically protected. So that stems a, a, a lot of a uh, lot of questions ab about security ranging fro from all the layers of, of security there so starting with can we trust that hardware is 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 proper right trusting the hardware layer uh, trusting the 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 uh, you know os and, and firm, firmware firmware levels of, of those devices and and you know thinking about uh, if someone someone you know tempered with with uh, with, with, with the software on, on the hardware and uh, so you know going from the hardware to the firmware and operating systems all the way to, to the to the microservices and applications running r running on, on on that hardware so you, you can see on the applications level level uh, are, are we you know running the container images that are supposed to be run there uh, uh, how, how are we you know uh, uh, sharing the secrets with, with, uh, to those uh, uh, unprotected locations and then and, and, you know do we have a mechanisms for those uh, microservices to, to be restricted in, in their own in their own uh, uh, so to say sandboxes and, and not interfere with, with each other and that makes sense and and at the same time I mean okay there are many many of the the challenges that we just discussed that are specific to the device but all of those devices ultimately will will speak to the cloud at some point right uh, those are not self-contained systems so uh, what role could we say that the cloud plays in edge device security yeah so, so in, in, in my point of view so so one thing that I didn't mention at, at first is is that you know 
they're all devices connecting to, to the edge infrastructure, right? That, that we are not uh, even not uh, uh, consider part of the edge. And and what we tr need to provide is 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 like a a, a, a single uh, continuously uh, experience for all that. And that's where 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 the cloud uh, play a, a massive role. So so we need to have uh, if, if you want to trust. Uh, devices that are connected. We, we need to have a, a, a proper uh, device management and device provisioning of, of those devices. If you want to, if you want to handle properly uh, operating system and, and firmware, we, we need to have a proper uh, rollout of the firmware to, to a, a large number of, of external uh, nodes. And of course, we, we need to have a, a, a trusted way to to to. To distribute our applications, microservices, uh, container images, and secrets to those locations. So that that's all the, the job of the cloud to provide that infrastructure to to basically manage all that in a scalable way. And obviously, at the Eclipse Foundation, we love open source. We work in open source all the time. Um, so, are there specific open source projects that address the challenges that you just told us about? Are there things that people can can download straight away and start building a secure edge uh, infrastructure with it? Yeah. So there is, but but uh, uh, my experience for the last last X years doing IoT and Edge, so it's hard to find a single solution to all, all the problems, right? So so you have all these bits and pieces dispersed to different projects trying to, to solve solve uh, different things. So for example, Eclipse Hono uh, contains uh, a concept of device registry, right, and and managing of, of credentials and, and and for secure connectivity of, of devices to the cloud or, or to the edge infrastructure. Eclipse Hogbit is, is another project that, that deals with, with uh, uh, software rollouts, updates of, of, of firmware and, and uh, basically any, any kind of software. Uh, but we also have, have things outside of the e Eclipse community as well. For example, the, the, the Harbor project is something that, that tries to provide a way uh, to be able to to have a like a distributed uh, container registry, which which can have a a, a really great place uh, into the you know edge computing with uh, with uh, Docker based and conta container based uh, uh, technologies. Okay, that makes sense. And and obviously our edge computing projects in the edge native working group have a, a, a deep concern about obviously uh, security. So so maybe uh, Angelo, uh, since you're you know involved in one of those, uh, what's your what's your perspective on this? Well, uh, so I think one of the of the aspects that we have to integrate when we talk about security in uh, in, in edge application is that in the end, yes, the cloud will have a role, but uh, if you really want to scale, uh, we need to make sure that, um, you know, we, in a way, we have a change of paradigm. And I think in two, in two, in two respects. So if we focus for a moment on data, um, if you think about how we have secured data so far, usually what you do, you build security around it, right? So you make sure that you can't access data that you don't have the rights to access. That's easy on a cloud environment, easy to import. But if you think about taking that approach and, and moving it to the edge, in which all of a sudden you have data that is decentralized, well, it's much easier to tamper with devices. So that's not going to work. So all of a sudden, I think, and at least that's the, the direction we are taking um, also in some of, of the our open source um, uh, project at, at Eclipse, is that uh, we have to change the paradigm and all of a sudden actually um, agree that uh, uh, device are out there, uh, people might get all the of the device, tamper the device and access the data. So the key point is that uh, with that data, they shouldn't be able to do anything. Okay, so we are trying to change completely the paradigm for what concerns security, at least at the data level, uh, and making sure that uh, you know, instead of assuming and making it hard for you to access, it's making it hard for you to do anything unless you have the right identity credential and so on and so forth. Um, so that poses quite a few challenges, uh, but again, I mean, up to when there will be interesting challenges, there will be interesting problems to solve, which is which is good. Uh, that poses challenges not just from the security perspective, but also from uh, the encryption, which all of a sudden requires some uh, uh, support from hardware, and um, 
poses also challenges with respect to um, secret, uh, being able to maintain secret in a secure manner, which as we know, you know, is supported by TPM um, and uh, uh, processor architecture like ARM and, and trust zones uh, provide also, you know, some, some additional way to, to deal with it, especially if you look in combination with some interesting unikernel that are also coming out uh, in, the, in, in the open source. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And at the same time, yeah, this operating system aspect is is important. And Nicola, you mentioned you are working on on embedded OSs for 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 edge devices. So, uh, taking on from from Angelo there, what's what's your perspective on on the edge security challenges? Uh, looking at from an uh, an embedded operating system standpoint, that is, you know, where my focus is. Uh, basically, we have two really great technologies that, that kicked in in the, in the past 15, 20 years. One, of, of course, is virtualization, and another one is, is, is you know, like related to containers. Uh, both of them, from a security standpoint, they provide what today is one of the most important aspects, in my opinion, in an embedded device like an edge node. Um, in the uh, in the edge architecture, that is the isolation, the context of isolation. How we do isolate uh, the uh, some different uh, aspects that are running in, on an edge on an edge node. Uh, virtual machines and containers are really different. Uh, virtual machine is an abstraction that of a complete computing platform, hardware and software. So I/O, uh, processor, memory. Uh, a container is purely software and um, they use the same kernel of the host. Uh, actually, a container is a child process of the daemon that launched it. So there are, there are completely different technologies, but at the same time, they guarantee what the, uh, you know, what isolation needs to be uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a device level. Um, the, the interesting thing about isolation is critical processes. So let's say that we have a, an edge device, an edge node, and we have a camera that is attached to the edge node. Uh, this is a simple case, but uh, again, we can see that uh, these, these kind of use cases in two different, different ways. Uh, for instance, uh, from a, a container perspective, we need um, uh, we have a, of course, the core OS that, uh, and then we have a containerized, uh, a containerized OS. And the, the containerized OS, let's say, that is running a software for for grabbing the camera uh, frames, and then uh, do something with it, and then transfer those information somewhere else. Uh, the thing is, we need how, how we do um, enable the container to access some devices. Let's say the device, the camera device and then uh, process and then do, do the job. Well, we can do that in a pretty fairly secure way uh, without a privileged mode, without having, without having any container running in privileged mode, just because we know exactly which device we need to export from the core OS to the container. On the same time, if this is not really guaranteed, let's say that we have other devices that are uh, managed by UDEV, and so we don't have a we don't have a predicted way to, to tell which device is needs to is generated by the core OS and needs to be uh, connected to the uh, to the container. We may have some problem over there, and you know there are like several recipes to solve that problem, but they may violate the the, the isolation principle. And uh, also having privileged uh, containers is not really a good practice. So it's about good practices. Virtual machine on the other side, they provide like an extremely uh, solid way to isolate uh, uh, critical critical application. Let's say that we have a, a edge device that is um, has some particular like important characteristics. Let's say that part of the system are in real time part of the system don't uh, have any time constraints like regular operating system, or part of the system needs to be uh, bare metal. How can we solve this problem? Containers, containers are great in edge because they provide a great deployment model. If you have microservices and some software that is purely software that needs to be deployed uniquely, uh, atomically inside a device and without like worrying about um, uh, dependencies. But at the same time, how we do 
how we do the same, how can we enable the same, um, the same um, easy way of managing deployments when we have a lot of hardware that is critical hardware attached to the edge now. So in this case, probably uh, virtualization, and when I say virtualization, because even Docker is virtualization, it's called lightweight virtualization, but a, a more, there is a, a, something that is more like um, uh, what I call, um, uh, is a more appropriate for this, for, for, for this use case, uh, that is the, the regular virtualization or asymmetric multiprocessing, which guarantee the uh, isolation of critical application and at the same time, they allow the edge node to do and to perform really critical aspects related to critical I.O. and other critical devices attached to it. That makes sense. And we will revisit, uh, obviously, the topic of, uh, uh, you know, the devices, virtualization container a bit a bit later. And, and one thing I, I really uh, uh, understand is important from from what you said, Nicola. Is the fact is isolation is 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 one critical thing to think about. You know, isolation of processors, resources, even hardware resources. And at the same time, edge nodes, edge infrastructure are connected devices, and networking is especially important in in everything that we do at the edge. Whatever whatever we're talking about, five G, uh, dash seven, or one, etc. Uh, and so, my question to you, Ted, uh, since networking is really your your bread and butter so uh, what what role does the network play in in edge device security yeah that, that's actually kind of a funny question because the the one of the main roles that uh, the network plays in security is to be the source of the problem right it's uh, you know it's, it's the thing that makes it you know obviously the network is extremely critical and important for what you want to do but it's also the channel through which abuse through which intrusion through which you know illegal access can occur so um so it's kind of an interesting thing so the network is a double-edged sword it's providing a lot of the problems uh with regard to security so it's very important that the network be set up in such a way that you are um, making it as difficult as possible to to exploit it in ways that you didn't anticipate. All right, and and now uh, that that's certainly a good a good uh, starting point. Uh, at the same time, I, I was wondering, you know, I'm not a networking expert, but I hear a lot about programmable networks, <laughs> software defined networks, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, are, are they really useful at the edge? All of those uh, securities, or do they do they introduce more vulnerabilities? And if they are useful, why? Okay, that's yeah, that's also an interesting question. I think because there's a lot of talk about uh, software-defined networking. There's actually a lot of open source activity around SDN. Um, it, in my opinion, uh, SDN is is um, highly com complicated, um, and it addresses issues at a layer of abstraction that may not be um, as helpful as we want. Um, typ typically, uh, SDN is, is really giving you software APIs that um, access uh, things like um, MAC addresses, IP addresses, host addresses, ports, uh, routing rules, etc. cetera. So um, I, what I actually think we need is, and this has been stated before, like a different paradigm, but I think we need better abstractions uh, for networking in in the edge, in edge computing, and in hybrid, and, and in basically uh, cloud native computing in general. Okay, and and that in in one way uh, really uh, not necessarily vindicates, but but matches my my expectation in the sense that as a as a non networking expert, I I had a feeling from the outside that uh, you know as the end that kind of stuff can can be useful, but yes, is is something that still need maturing and still need uh, to, to progress uh, to, to be uh, useful. And at the same time, I know that a few of our members are uh, leveraging or involved in, in, in such projects like uh, OpenNES and uh, Open Source Mano and ONAP and that kind of stuff. Now, uh, if we take a step back, 
uh, obviously, uh, as I mentioned, open source is really important to us. So how, how can open source help improve edge network security? Yourself, Ted, you know, you've been involved in such projects and especially Scopper uh, uh, is a good example of that. So how can open source really help there? Yeah, let me talk a little bit about that because because you know I mentioned before that we really we're, we're looking for better abstractions and and one of the, let me uh, talk a little bit about the weakness of some of the extractions extractions that we use now. So anybody who's done any networking at all really knows that when you're talking about addressing things, you you deal with a host address and a port. So you know the host address can be an IP address, but most more commonly it's a name that maps to an IP address, which gets you to the host, and then the port tells you which process on that host you want to talk to. And of course, in the in the cloud native world, um, you know, we're talking about things like serverless, or we're talking about you know, edges where we may have many edges or many devices that we want to address as a class. The host really isn't that interesting. In fact, we don't want to be bothered with that notion. Um, the other thing I should mention is that the, you know, the, the internet as we know it now grew up with client server computing. So client server architecture is what the internet is designed for. So it's, it's really built around, you know, literally hundreds of millions of private networks that then connect up into a single public network. So this vertical orientation of the network is, is you know, very well proven and it works very well and it's very highly performant but it doesn't lend itself very well to edge computing where we really might wanna have some horizontal connectivity. We might want different edges to be able to easily address each other. And that's not done very well at the IP host level. So, um, so there is quite a bit, in fact, I think almost all the really interesting work that's going on in this space is, is happening in the open source communities. So there, there's the scupper.io um, project that I'm working on um, it's actually also based on the um, Apache Cupid dispatch router. So Apache Cupid is a collection of, pro of projects, one of which is called Cupid Dispatch Router, which is a, um, a high level networking router that uh, works with the AMQP protocol and a whole different set of addressing. So instead of addressing hosts in a large network, you're addressing processes. and so instead of providing host access to a hacker, for example, you, you, you deny that access, but you can provide access to specific processes. And it allows you to do things like multicast load balancing in a wide area. But that's, these are not necessarily security related, but it does have security um, aspects to it. I'll also mention that the Eclipse IO Fog uh, project is um, also using the same basic technology to good effect as well. And, they, and you know, their focus is a little bit more on small devices in the edge and connectivity involving those small devices on the edge. That makes sense. Uh, so it's, it's certainly really interesting what, what do you, you, you mentioned, Ted. Uh, and one question I would have uh, for you is we discussed in our edge native uh, working group community meetings, the, you know, various scenarios for device quarantine in the sense that a compromised device could self quarantine or maybe the network could could quarantine the device. Uh, so in, in your opinion, uh, where, where, where you know, is self quarantine more useful than network quarantine or the other or both are uh, useful strategies in your opinion? Um, yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question. I think probably both um, uh, that you that you would need if a, if a device knows that it's compromised, it would also take itself out. If you know that the device is co compromised, you'd like to take it out. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, I think both are, are, are uh, important. And uh, I think that, that somebody else might be a, more of an expert to answer that question than I. That makes sense. And going going with the same question to to you, Dihan, since I mean, uh, you mentioned uh, several device management technologies that we have at Eclipse, and and especially that's a concern for Eclipse all know that you are working on. So, uh, what what's your take on device quarantine there? <laughs> well. Uh... From the perspective of of, uh, of uh, Eclipse Hono, the device is, is outside of, of the cloud, so we, we, we are thinking about uh, you know just the, just the connectivity from the cloud. But but if you if you take a look at, at the you know glo globally from the edge perspective, uh, guaranteeing microservices definitely does 
does does make make sense. So you know, limit them in the amount of of uh, you know uh, uh, CPU they can use or, or resources they can use. Pre pre uh, uh, then on the networking layer, what you mentioned is is also you know making sure that they can't do any any arbitrary uh, any arbitrary outbound connections and, and uh, dial-ins to, to different places. That, that, that's all. I think very important aspects of, of uh, running uh, microservices at the edge. Excellent, thank you. And now in the interest of time, uh, going forward with uh, another topic, and this is something we started already discussing with Nicola, uh, embedded devices, virtualization, containers, and we already established this, you know, the different security roles that virtual machines and, and containers can, can play now. Uh, when we think about embedded and mobile devices, Nicola, they are increasingly seen as, as edge devices. And I know that some of our members at some point were playing with the idea, hey, I have someone in a factory, you know, with its tablet, and maybe we can delegate some, some edge workloads to the tablet that the employee is, uh, is having that kind of stuff. But anyway, if we take a, a more global perspective about embedded and mobile devices as edge devices, what, what are the security challenges that you've seen in your work? Uh, that uh, you think are specific to them? From, a, from an engineering perspective, I don't think there is um, any difference between a mobile, mobile device and an embedded device. My phone is an ARM64 and pretty much uh, it shares uh, many of the uh, uh, IO of my embedded board I'm working on doing an, an, uh, an embedded uh, custom operating system. So let's talk about like they almost are the same hardware, but there is something that makes a difference between uh, the, the two of them is what you want to attach to them. So in the case of a mobile phone, so let's say that uh, in, the, in the future, in the industry 5.0, we have workers walking around a, 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 a factory with their phone, with their tablet, that is an edge node. Uh, in that context, because I don't see those devices to, to, to be connected to a special machine or, or some, some special hardware, I guess that uh, the container technology is what provides this extremely important way to deploy software in, 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 in one shot. I remember Linus Torvalds say something <laughs> really interesting about you know, package managing. And he said, like, if all the software was statically compiled, we don't have problems of dependencies anymore. And so we don't have to go through a lot of resolution issues, like when we wanted to transfer software to different devices. And so containers brought that concept on it. Of course, I'm, I'm, you know, on a different, on a different context, but still they bring that value on, hey, let's uh, deploy something that is uh, consistent and I can, uh, distribute those resources across multiple devices and this is great but again the in my opinion in, in a real use case scenario inside a factory we have some some of those embedded devices that needs to command and instruct other machines um, in the in the pipeline and this this is where actually the technologies may be not any more suitable for doing the same thing so from a security perspective, again, for me is how can I prevent a critical process that's control a, a, a special machine, uh, that critical process needs to be protected, needs to be, again, isolated from the outside world. What if a microservices is doing something bad to the CPU, is, there is a, a DOS attack, so there is like a, a denial of service, there is some sort of overflow. How can I uh, actually make the machine that is operating safe in that context and try to isolate and shut down whatever is going wrong in a particular partition of the system. And again, here, embedded systems are really complex, uh, they're really complex beasts because we have multiple core. Every core can host an, an operating system. It's called like, again, um, asymmetric multi um, multiprocessing. So if I have different cores that address, you know, different OSs, I may have like a supervised or unsupervised architecture, uh, but at the same time, in those two different scenarios, I have a completely, con I have a complete control of which resources are allocated from another perspective to the specific task. Well, at that point, I can play with uh, virtual machines 
and I can deploy containers in virtual machines, but at the same time, I'm, guarant I'm, I'm guaranteeing that no processes are interfering with other processes. So in the case of a tablet, in the case of a phone, I guess we can pretty much be okay on a very effective deployment model with containers. And so I can really um, uh, have a, a backplane and this backplane decides uh, what needs to be distributed on the edges. And that's cool. But at the same time, we need to keep an eye on which resources physically are addressed when something is computing on the machine, when something is going on on the edge devices. And this is where we can play with both of them. We can create hybrid systems. So we can really do a lot of interesting things, really ex work with fantasy and, and of course with uh, you know adherence to the reality. Of course, we cannot really invent uh, weird stuff. But again, in that context, the open source is providing a lot of inputs. Again, it's more about best practices, in my opinion. But again, we have open source uh, technologies for for um, embedded computers, and um, you know, that ARM right now is now really important inside the uh, the virtualization context. Uh, Zen, that is probably the most uh, important, like today, virtualization technology on ARM computers. Uh, sorry, ARM processors, architectures. Um, it's an open source technology um, and is, you know, uh, it, it works really well, not everywhere, not in every platform, platform uh, but of course it's a good baseline. Uh, Docker is like, of course, the containerized uh, technology that, you know, is working everywhere in the world. And there are other also technologies. I like, you know, I, I like exploring different other uh, technologies about virtualization. I like monolithic virtualization. Uh, this is what, you know, I like the most, uh, but it's very tight to the hardware. Uh, Xvisor is a beautiful uh, project out there uh, for, for doing monolithic um, uh, custom uh, hypervisors uh, on, 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 on embedded devices. So again, how you orchestrate this is driven by probably uh, good sense and, and, and best practices, but out there, there are so many different things that you can play with to just invent your own architecture that make, you know, safe tablets and computer and regular like mobile devices and also critical devices where something is really important needs to be preserved and, uh, and take care of. And then uh, we talked a lot about uh, devices and, and going back a bit on the networking team, I tended to ask all of you, uh, let's say you have to deploy, uh, well, an edge, uh, a solution that in, involves edge computing. So is it better to run that on the same network as every everything else? Let's say you are in a factory, you have edge nodes, you have robots. So you connect all of that on a single network you know, that is connected to the IT network of the organization or in a separate one or some hybrid model? What what would be your, your topology of choice there to ensure that things are secure? Well, I mean, first, first question is, what is your topology and technology of choice to make sure that things work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're in a factory, our experience is that you can essentially forget Wi-Fi. Um, so for anything that moves around or needs connectivity and for which you don't have already you know a dedicated network uh, the direction we we have been taking the past few years is obviously uh, industrial 4g and going forward uh, we just see one technology for for all uh, wireless uh, one dominant dominant technology for wireless te communication inside the factory which is 5g as you know, 5G was designed uh, first and foremost uh, for facilitating certain enterprise use cases. And that's where it will allow us to innovate the most. Uh, 5G uh, will allow also potentially properly configured and used by the higher level software to do some millisecond real time, um, which, which is interesting for, for quite a few industrial application. Um, <clears throat> and uh, will facilitate perhaps you know, the, the, the connection between the portion of the if you're on a factory floor, the machine that necessarily will have to run either on uh, you know, TSN when they get there, or as of today, continue to run on uh, you know, field bus or, or similar technologies. And then the world of, of IT that uh, you know, will remain on uh, more or less uh, Ethernet-based uh, solution. 
So as you know, the, the conversions that it has, had been envisioned was really with TSN. The complexity that TSN poses is that you have to pass, uh, you know, you, you have to upgrade some, some of that hardware um, and you have a wire. So what we are seeing actually on, on, the, um, on the market is that in several instances, there is a preference toward converging toward you know, 5G uh, and retaining some of the field bus as they are and then integrate the rest out of that. Yeah, so the concept of a sort of gateway that, you know, exactly. plays a role of a bridge between yes. the whole stuff, the mud bus, the back net then, that you've got yes. on the floor versus the rest, yes. Then what I think is the most promising in terms of security and, um, uh, let's say, electromagnetic um, interference or tolerance to electromagnetic uh, interference is Li-Fi. So Li-Fi, maybe some of you know, is in heavy use in Hollywood. It has been so far too expensive to be used in industrial. But uh, what is interesting is that you have no interference with you know, a robot arm that moves. And in terms of security, as far as every wall, or if I close window, nothing gets out of it because it's based on light. So we are not there yet, but uh, for me, that's a, a super interesting um, you know, future, future direction to follow closely. And uh, we are experimenting with some of it. Yeah. Certainly something to keep an eye on. And, and continuing with you, Angelo, so we talked a lot about networking, we talked a lot about uh, devices. So what I would try to, to get a bit uh, <coughs> deeper about with you, um, hardware versus software, centralized versus decentralized. Um, you know, when we consider edge device security, we talked about some hardware aspects, some software aspects, but is it really a, more of a hardware or a software issue, in your opinion? Well, from my perspective, it's, it's actually both, right? Because, um, <clears throat> and in fact, there is hardware, software, and network. Uh, that's, that's really the three. Because the hardware has to provide us with some basic capability, right? Uh, in some cases, in terms of you know, proper either acceleration or computation capability for, for doing encryption, the ability of storing secrets securely and in such a way that it's tamper proof. Um, but then, once the hardware provides that, and we have solution for, for that today, the software has to leverage it, okay? And that's where sometimes we have issue today. The, pro the communication protocol we use, you know, as it was mentioned by that before, there are lots of things that, um, you know, are, are not quite right for the use case we want to address. So he mentioned a few interesting problems, but, you know, the, the underlying problem, as he mentioned, is that we need to move from host centricity to name data. And as you know, we have also some, some very innovative project in, uh, in um, Eclipse IoT and Edge like Xeno, which is an, a named data networking protocol. And uh, if you start reasoning about that, networks becomes important because the way in which, in which you designed your protocol uh, makes some attack harder, right? Um, uh, makes load balancing easier, makes security easier, and uh, makes the combination of decentralization and security easier. So I see really hardware as providing, you know, some of the basic prerequisite that we need in order to be able to build security. But then we need to use those to properly implement security within the software that runs on it, right, at the various level and in the network. And one of the important, I would say, element that uh, is not, I mean, it's a facilitator, but which we shouldn't, shouldn't underestimate it also, is also the programming language that we use. As you know, we've always been kind of orthodox with that, right? And, uh, but, but we see, for instance, the race of Rust as um, you know, a good example of a programming language that provides you with a good set of, let's say, invariants that make it easier to build secure software. You know, that, that was one of the reasons why also Mozilla introduced it. And, um, and, and I think that uh, you know, we, have to, we have, in a way, even in our development process, to start being a little bit more cautious of all the decisions we take down to the programming language that we use, potentially. And certainly that has a big impact. Uh, and at the same time, one, one important thread that we've seen in the last few years is the emergence of open source hardware, you know, as a, as a driver for innovation. So uh, at the Eclipse Foundation, we work with uh, the open hardware group that essentially takes the open source RISC-V instruction set and makes open source 
processor designs and they are uh, built in the open by, by various partners and all of that. So uh, at AD Link, Angelo, you do, you do hardware. So how, how, do, how does uh, uh, open source hardware factor in your, uh, in your vision for edge device uh, security? Yeah, so for, I think uh, open source hardware has helped a lot in terms of uh, accelerating innovation. I mean, let me give an example, right? I have an example of open source hardware here. Not, not sure if all of you are familiar with this card. Yeah, absolutely. I've got one. <laughs> right? So that's a super cool example of co-design, right? Because they've designed this, uh, this board in a, in a hackathon. It uses ARM processor and uh, it's designed for Zephyr. Right, which is one of the US we use. So, um, I mean, for me, uh, open source hardware, it's interesting because it allows us to do some level of co-design with software and to get, uh, in a way, um, you know, platform that all of a sudden are very accessible and allow people to experiment. And then we can leverage further experience to eventually you know, produce then hardware that maybe is not open source or not necessarily um, and uh, can address the more extreme use cases where you need uh, you know, either extended temperature or some specific certification, uh, which are required either for security or for safety on some environment. Imagine, uh, you know, edge server that, uh, that control the high speed lines in trains, right? Um, but, but I think overall, as it was done for software, open source hardware has helped innovation uh, but as a consequence of the fact that more people get a chance to to review it, test it, it helps with, with security for sure. Um, but I think first and foremost, where it has helped is in accelerating innovation and uh, the, the level at which people can, can experiment with uh, you know, integrated platforms, like for instance, what I just showed you. Yes. So there are, I think that an interesting, an interesting uh, thing that Angelo uh, said um, is about driving innovation. Uh, today, uh, you know, when we look at a uh, chip manufacturer, uh, there is a lot of proprietary things that are going on in there, and so, so many of the things that um, may be possible are not are not possible because the chip manufacturer is not ready yet for something. So when you have to adopt, let's say, a microprocessor on on a product, you gotta also understand what the manufacturer is is giving you uh, with you know, to support that processor. So let's say that you, uh, for instance, you, you choose like a, a provider and uh, you have a basic BSP. That basic BSP that where there is a lot of code and a lot of things that the manufacturer did develop because he has the IP on the processor that he, he does manufacture, it binds you from the beginning to something that may be or may be okay, but maybe not. So I think that Risk Five and the open hardware community is just breaking that barrier. Finally, finally, we may have like a, a system that is fully transparent since the inception. So, from a security perspective, let's say that uh, let's talk about um, the ARM Trust Zone. So today, Trust Zone is a really nice way to save secrets uh, inside uh, an embedded system. Uh, but again, the implementation the really raw and low level implementation of the ARM trust zone in a real product when I buy a, a, a SOM module is driven by the chip manufacturer. If I don't have a reference implementation of, of trust zone in that particular context, I cannot use trust zone. So again, open hardware is I really, you know, enjoy so much following what's going on in that, in that, in that space because Finally, there is more democracy. It, like in software, has been like for thirty years. Uh, now, uh, you know, it's time for that same democracy to be on a hardware level, providing like a great transparency and a great innovation. And I agree with Angelo. This is absolutely groundbreaking for, for that. Space. And, and, and we see this open hardware and open source model even even in the networking space. I think, uh, although that's not a space I follow a lot, but. Uh, I know there are open source designs for network switches and specialized uh, open source op OSs that you can run on that. So the potential for improvement, obviously, and openness is uh, still increasing as we as we go forward as an industry. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have.
but uh, really uh, it's been, I think, an enlightening conversation and uh, certainly one that I hope that we will be able to continue in future panels and future discussions, uh, uh, you know, over time. So, uh, Angelo, Dihan, Nicola, Ted, thank you so much for being with us today and discussing this. And uh, you all in the audience, if you liked what you heard and like to exchange with our panelists today, well, please join us in our community meetings for the Edge Native Working Group. We are an open community welcoming to, uh, well, everyone really willing to exchange ideas and, and discuss the state of the industry and drive innovation in open source. So please uh, join us and uh, we'll be happy to, well, continue to discuss everything that we discussed today and even more with you. So uh, thank you for being with us today. My name is Frédéric Devien, Program uh, Manager for IoT and Edge Computing at the Eclipse Foundation. And this was our panel on edge device security. So everyone, thank you again, and uh, I hope to talk to you soon.